one person. OK, so you saw David Anderson talk about Kinevin. Um, when Dave Snowden introduced it uh, a few years back to us, uh, my friend Chris Matz was in the room. He said, um, Kinevin's already, it's all very lovely and everything, but nobody's ever used it for anything practical, um, and certainly not in software development. And the thing is, it fell into place with a lot of ideas I was thinking about at the time, particularly around um, Dan North's deliberate discovery. Um, and I started experimenting using it alongside behavior-driven development. That worked really well. I'm not going to talk about BDD today, but if anyone wants to come and ask me how can Evan plays into BDD a little bit, um, then I'll be happy to do that as well. Um, I wanted to just start by, um, so sorry, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about differentiation and how it plays into Kinevin. I'll talk about deliberate discovery and also real options, which can help us move from the chaotic space into the complex one, help it give us um, a safety net so we can experiment safely. And I'm also going to talk about the role of diversity and chaos in generating ideas and generating experiments in the first place. I wanted to just start off by telling a little story. Um, I was working a, as a mixed developer coach on a project a couple of years back. And towards the end of the release, so we're coming up to release, um, somebody said, yeah, you know we've got this default, and it was, a, it was a trading system, so we had a default of purchase, and the alternative was a sale. And they said, we really, really, really don't want that default to be there anymore, at all. And this was a big problem because we had asked specifically loads and loads of times, are you sure that this is okay as a default? And everybody said yes. And so we rather foolishly had represented this thing throughout the system as just a Boolean, true as a purchase, false as a, as a sale. Um, and it was a nightmare to undo. It took us two weeks to undo it and to turn it into an actual proper little object so that we could have an empty space. Um, we ended up doing some really nasty hacks on the back end just to get it out and release at the right time. Um, and it was, it was not pleasant. The business were a bit miffed because it didn't play nicely with some other systems. And our project manager said to us, OK, we got this wrong. So what we need to do now is spend more time analyzing this so we get it right. Because I'm not having this again. And I said, well, hold on. We did do the analysis on this. We did ask. The thing was, it was a completely new interface. And we made this discovery about this new interface, this thing we'd never tried before. Um, so it, I don't see how any amount more analysis would have let us make that discovery earlier. We would have made it anyway. But here's what we would have done. We would have put a ton of investment into the analysis up front, which would then make it harder to make the change because we'd have to undo the analysis as well. And then the business would be even more upset when they made these discoveries. And given that we've made that investment, we'll want to make more investment to get it even more right. And then it will be harder to change. And then we'll make more investment. And then it will be harder to change. And before you know it, this will be a waterfall project. And I don't want to go down that route. Discoveries are a natural part of any knowledge work, software development, um, anything where there is high levels of uncertainty. So what I want to talk about today is some techniques for actually managing that uncertainty. So it plays really heavily into that complex space in the Kinevin chart. But I'm also going to talk about how to spot where the uncertainty is likely to happen. And I'm going to give you some techniques that I have used. Um, so one of, this is rare for me. I, I do a lot of thought leadership and, and espousing theories. This is stuff which I've actually done with real clients, and it's made a massive difference to them. So I'm going to talk about my experience of actually using Kinevin on the ground. So I wanted to start just with this book. This is one of my favorite books in the world, uh, Waltzing with Bears, Tom DeMarco and Timothy Lister. And it's about managing risk on software projects, but it could really be about managing uncertainty in any situation. And chapter one starts with this in a big box. If a project has no risks, don't do it. 
The reason being, if you are doing something that has no risks, it's because you're certain it can be done. And the only way you can be certain it can be done is because it's been done before. In the same context, by the same people, with the same technology. At every single project we do has something about it that's completely different to what has already happened before. And that difference is where the risk is. Differentiators um, are the core of anything we try and do. Every single thing we try and do is to get us to a different place from where we were before. Uh, I actually got this idea from David Anderson himself. So he was talking about mobile phones. And he talks about the camera phone. Right? So if I'm making the first ever camera phone, um, Sharp were the people who made the first one, I believe, and then Kyocera followed shortly afterwards. And Kyocera put the camera on the front so that it would point towards the person making the call because they thought people would use it for video calls. That was what they thought people would use it for. The duck face hadn't been invented at that point. Um, so what do you think they focused on? Getting the camera into the phone or making it be able to receive calls, make calls? You focus on the thing that's different. You focus on the thing that's new. You know you can make a, a phone in a certain amount of size. Now it's going to be slightly bigger and it's going to have a camera in as well. And that's the differentiator. That's the thing we're focusing on. We also, at some point, start seeing camera phones. Nokia particularly took the camera. They popularized it. And it started becoming what we call spoilt. And now every single phone has a camera on it. Hands up if you do not, if you're, hands up if you don't have a mobile phone. Okay, everybody's got a mobile phone. Hands up if your mobile phone does not have a camera on it. One person. Okay, so now having a phone with, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's actually critically important if you work in a defence, you know, you, you go into some defence bases um, in the UK and they won't let you take your, look at that, look at that, old school. Isn't it tiny? Isn't it amazing how tiny it is though? Um, <laughs> battery life of about two weeks, fantastic. Okay, so um, it's now a differentiator to have a phone that doesn't have a camera on it. It's really hard to find. And if you work in these defence spaces, they won't let you take a camera in. Right? So you're allowed to take a mobile phone as long as it doesn't have a camera. So that is now a differentiator. But you also have commodities, things like making the calls, receiving the calls. Um, David calls them table stakes. Things you need to have just to play the game. Okay? Where do you think the risk is? Over here, over here, <laughs> right? This is where the risk is on the project, but it's also where the value is. It's where the innovation is. It's where the thing you're actually going to make the money out of is. There's also a different type of software. I mean, I come from a software background, but this is applicable to just about everything. Um, we call it expediting Kanban. Um, things you need to do really, really urgently. And they will override flow. So David has this saying, value trumps flow, flow trumps waste, elimination of waste. Um, if you have something really urgent that you absolutely have to do, forget the flow, just flip and do it. Um, last year, Night Trading managed to release something to production that started making random trades on their behalf. Really random trades. And they, they lost billions in the space of a few minutes and had to shut it down very, very quickly. Um, I was talking to somebody else who worked in a different investment bank and they said they, that they did what a lot of the big investment banks do and they very kindly wound back the trade because it was obviously a mistake. And apparently all the investment banks have this agreement because they know one day it's going to happen to them too. Of course, all the small hedge funds just went, no. <laughs> so they did actually lose quite a lot of money. Um, Rumour has it they released a test harness to production um, I don't know whether that's true. Um, David mentioned carters. Uh, when I created this diagram, I was actually thinking of software development carters, exercises that we do. They have really predictable outcomes, very predictable. So, for instance, you might do something like um, turning numbers into Roman numerals or fizzbuzz 
if any of you know that game, one, two, if it's divisible by three, you say fizz, four, if it's divisible by five, you say buzz, if it's divisible by both, you say fizz buzz, and it's just a kid's game. But it's a really nice exercise, and it gives you this brilliant safety net for trying out other things that may be less simple, like test-driven development. Um, but it equally applies to martial arts. I was actually thinking about martial arts, and I hadn't seen what David's keynote was about when I wrote this. So I'm very pleased to see he's got Carter's up, but from a different perspective. Okay, so I've talked about the kind of problems. I'm now going to show you how this correlates to Kinevin. Um, so first of all, big thanks to David Snowden and Cognitive Edge. David Snowden is a person who came up with this, and an awful lot of um, the ideas I'm talking about in this talk have come from Cognitive Edge. There's tons of material about it. Um, Real Options comes from Chris Matz. Deliberate Discovery comes from Dan North. Uh, Olaf Marson has also done a lot of work on Real Options, but I came across it through Chris first. Um, anyway, so there's a type of problem in the world that kids can solve. His buzz, Roman numerals. I used to program stuff like that when I was on my little BBC age seven. Um, so they're, they're simple. And what we do with those problems is we categorize them. We go, oh, it's one of those types of problems. We look at it, we go, yeah, I can see how to fix that. So uh, the, the example Cognitive Edge uses, your chain falls off your bicycle. You go, oh, look at that, put it back on again. There are complicated problems. And a complicated problem is one which requires expertise to solve. Um, my favorite example is the watch. So a watchmaker can take a pot watch and put it back together again. Have any of you come across the term frog thinking versus bicycle thinking? No? So the idea of frog, frog versus bicycle thinking is you can take a bicycle <coughs> apart and put it back together and again it'll work fine. But you can't do that with a frog. <laughs> a frog is complex. Of organisms where their behavior is more than just the sum of their parts. Properties emerge as a result of what you're creating. Uh, a complex adaptive system, which is most human ones, a complex adaptive system is one where as soon as you start looking at it, as the observers within the system look at the system, they start changing the system as well. So it changes all the time. And a complex system is not predictable. The outcomes emerge. And one of the things you have to do in here is experiment if you try and treat it as predictable and do the same thing again, and somebody picked me up on this because I retweeted a, a very, uh, very well-known quote, um, the definition of madness is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. I can't remember who came up with that, Einstein or somebody. It was Einstein, right? In the complex space, doing the same, same thing again and again and expecting the same result is mad because your context changes every time. Doesn't apply with Angry Birds. Angry Birds is a predictable system. It is a predictable system. It's you who's complex and you're learning. But Angry Birds, if you've ever played it, you can actually work out which pixel to shoot the bird at. And you can get quite good at it. OK. Uh, and in fact, it's a really great example because um, there is expertise associated with Angry Birds. And you can learn it from somebody who's done it before. If you're getting frustrated with Angry Birds, you go to YouTube, you watch the video, then you know how to do it. Right? Oh, look, you do it like that. Right, OK. Um, I made the mistake. In fact, I'll, I'll tell the story when I come to the disorder. Um, the chaotic domain, uh, they refer to it as accident and emergency. Your house is burning down. And the important thing in the chaotic domain is to act. Now, chaos is normally associated with disruption, devastation. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use it in a positive way and what we call a shallow dive into chaos. But in, it, it's usually something really disruptive and devastating happening, and it usually resolves itself very quickly, perhaps not in your favor. When I blogged about this, and I blogged about Kinevin in software development, Ron Jeffries, who's one of the Agile Manifesto authors, um, came and he said on the blog, is it wise to do something that's not s safe to fail, even in chaos? I said, well, if your house is burning down and you don't get out, you're going to die. And there's nothing safe to fail about it 
but it doesn't stop you from trying to get out the house, right? You've got to act. And this is why we drill, so that you don't have to think, you don't have to analyse. You don't stop to pick up your bag. You know, get out, get out, get out. And you know where the emergency exit is, so you don't have to go, oh, I wonder whether this way is better than this way. Right? I fly a lot, and I still listen to the safety announcements on the aeroplanes. Uh, the reason for that is because a lot of the time when chaos hits, there's a, 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 a symptom that people get where they freeze and they freeze in place. And the more I rehearse what I'm going to do in case of an emergency, the more I'm likely to be the first out the plane. <laughs> if you're lucky, I might stop and help you out as well. <laughs> okay. In the middle, we have disorder. And the, the disorder domain is one where we're not sure which domain dominates. So, we tend to act according to our preferred domain. Um, are there any software developers in the room? Lots of you, yay, hi software developers. Okay guys, what do we do when we're forced to do the same boring thing over and over again with very predictable results? We automate it, absolutely. So software developers do not like being in the complicated domain. Are there any testers? One tester at the back. Okay, so I do not understand how testers have the patience to do that, to do the same thing over and over again when it's mostly predictable. Yes, it, is. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> right. Um, down here at the bottom, we have this little cliff. And that little cliff is there because on the border of simplicity and chaos is complacency. It is easy to tip from simplicity to chaos and very hard to get back again. So night trading is a really good example of that. A really good example of that, you know, they, they made such a simple automated system and then one day it just went horribly wrong. Okay. So we know that you have spoilers that move from differentiators to commodities. We also have automation moving back the other way. So when we automate, it becomes a different complex problem again. Okay? So just before we uh, leave the previous slide, so when you said chaotic, you differentiate that from like chaos theory, which is more closer to complex theory. Yeah, yeah. I'm using these words in the specific way that complexity thinkers do. Um, even complicated and complex in plain English have the, their synonyms, but they use them in this different way. If you ever get stuck remembering which one is which. Complicated is the one with more parts. Okay? Um, so, yeah, you get this cycle of things being spoiled and commoditized as they become better understood. And then as they become better understood and we try and make them repeatable and we create tools, it goes back the other way. So we have this cycle that goes round and round and round. Okay. I'm not sure why those slides are in there. Right, never mind. Um, okay, so, so oh, let me talk about some of the things I've been doing with this. Um, one of the things I've been looking at is w actually estimating what kind of complexity we're looking at in requirements. So if I take something, okay, I had some timing issues with this, and I apologise because I thought I'd fix them, but there's something weird going on with uh, PowerPoint on my computers. Um, okay, so. I'm just going to keep doing this. You can see what, what I've done here. These aren't really software requirements, but they are things that fall into the different domains, the different categories. So we've got self-driving cars, really new thing. They're still understanding how this is happening, how we can make this work. They have yet to work out how to actually get them onto the road. Um, the manned Mars mission, if it ever happens, the chances are that we'll learn quite a lot from it. Right? So, these are really innovative stuff. Apple's fan base is their differentiator, the fact they have this map in marketing. And everybody would like to have the same impact in marketing that Apple manages to get. Also, their bank balance. <laughs> right? Mending watches is a complicated activity. But we get new watches all the time. Um, SAP 
is something I reckon is, is complicated, but it's on the border of complexity. So these things aren't quadrants. Never ever call them quadrants because they get really upset. <laughs> um, these are domains. They have fuzzy, curved boundaries. One of the things that we like to do a lot of the time is that when we do this mapping and we'll, we'll map, um, one of the things I went and did was I went to Stack Exchange and just grabbed a whole load of um, terms and ideas from uh, programmers Stack Exchange and from um, Stack Overflow and got people to map them and put the lines in afterwards. So you can turn this sense-making activity into something complex itself where the outcomes merge. Um, I always put user registration over here because it's boring and we understand it really well as a, a software example. Um, dates are very well understood. We have libraries in software that will handle dates. And we've, we've got over the old Java date time that used to eat your CPU up, created a new calendar object every time you made a comparison. Um, yeah, <laughs> back in the days when that was expensive. Turns out that if you're in the energy business and trying to work out how much electricity people use, and there's one day every year which is 23 hours and one which is 25, it requires some expertise to know how long those days are going to be and, and to actually decide what the beginning of one date means and the end of one date means. And you have different contexts which apply. Um, if you find yourself estimating complexity with the ones down here and the fives down here, and you're actually in chaos, don't bother estimating, right? That's why I don't take it down this far, because you should just be acting at that point. Estimating and analysis and talking about things is not something you should be doing. Get the experts in, get them to fix it. Okay. So the benefits I have found from this. Um, if I take a project, and I ask them to pick, chunk it up and tell me what the uh, chunks are. And I'll talk a little bit about capabilities and how I actually draw out capabilities. Um, but you get the capabilities and you estimate them on the scale of one to five. One, and I, I do it as five means nobody in the world has ever done it. Four means somebody in the world has done it, but it's probably one of your competitors. Three means that you've got the expertise somewhere in your company. Somebody in your company's done it before. A two is someone in your team has done it before, and a one means uh, everybody in the team knows how to do it. Date libraries. If you look at that, every single project has a four or a five in it. And those are complex. Even if you know somebody else has done it, you still don't know how they did it. You don't know what discoveries they made along the way. You don't know what stakeholders came out the woodwork to try and stop them. You don't know who got fired for taking too long over it. So it's still got quite a lot of complexity to it. So I look for fives and fours, and every single project has one. Just as an example, I was working with um, some healthcare providers, and we were talking about the different projects. And I will tell you what, for those of you doing BDD, it takes on a whole new meaning when the uh, when is when the fetus heartbeat stops. They were just replacing an interface between three systems. That was all they were doing. Um, and I said, okay, tell me why you're doing that. What is it going to give you that you don't already have? That's a nice way of asking why. It's less childish than the kid in the back of the car. What's it going to give you that you don't have? They said, well, right now the hardware and deployment costs uh, are coming from this vendor who's got the interface that are too high. So we're, we're going to do it ourselves to reduce the hardware and deployment costs. I said, oh, great. So who cares about the hardware and deployment costs? And they said, well, the ops team do, IT operations. I said, okay, have you had a chat with them about how they are going to test whether it's reducing the hardware and deployment costs? Hadn't even considered it. They hadn't spotted that that was their differentiator and that those, that operations team were their main stakeholders. And all of their discoveries were going to come from that space and those conversations. And they weren't having them. So I want to talk through feature injection. This is a mechanism I use to try and work out who I should be talking to at different levels of scale. Um, and it's, it's creation of Chris Matt, 
he's the same guy who put the given in given when then in BDD. Um, you start with a primary stakeholder. And the, the primary stakeholder has a project which is either going to make money, save money, or protect money. I once worked for a company called ThoughtWorks, and an evening event I had somebody come up and say to me, um, Liz, I can't find anyone to talk through about these requirements. I said, well, what about the person who cares about the project? So nobody cares about the project. I said, okay, who's providing the money for the project because they care? He said, no, he doesn't. I said, what do you mean? Why does he not care about the money he's providing for the project? He, she said, he's just using up his budget for this quarter so he can get it again next quarter. <laughs> this is not a good reason for creating a project. There are better things you can do with the money. So a mature company has a vision before they start a project which will make money, save money, or protect money. And this is an experiment. We're not sure, but we, we can realistically say we think the impact will be good. And protecting money might mean stopping your, um, your, your users from leaving for another competitor. It might mean providing options for yourself for the future. How many of you have done legacy system replacements? How many of those? Keep your hands up if... At some point, you've been... Keep your hands up if it was to make it easier to change later. And keep your hands up if, at some point during the project, you ended up cutting corners, which would make it hard to change to get it out quicker. Right? You lose your differentiator because you're not focused on it. And almost certainly, I bet half of you at least did not have metrics to actually look and measure that differentiator. The code quality, the maintainability of it. Without that focus on the differentiator, it's so easy to lose it. So you have this primary stakeholder. You have an incidental stakeholder whose goal must be met in order to go live. And that they'll, there's usually, I found, about 15 to 30 of these people. Some of them, we will be used to meeting those goals. And it will just be something that everybody knows how to do. A few of them will be problematic. Sometimes one of them will be new. Some new regulation comes in. So they will also be a four or five. If I, I always reckon if a project has more than two fours or fives in it, split the project up. You know, meet his goals and then do the next new thing. Don't try and do 15 complex things all at once. Um, but the incidental stakeholder, and it's things that are needed not things that are wanted. So if those of you who are used to working on waterfall projects, I found business have this habit, this tendency of wanting to put everything in the bucket all at once because it's the only chance they'll get to sign up for it. If you can narrow it down to what is actually needed, who's read the Phoenix project and the security guy in the Phoenix project who doesn't realize what's actually needed? It's a brilliant book, by the way, for those of you who haven't, need, who haven't read it. It's a novel about DevOps and Kanban. Really easy read. Um, everybody I know who's read it has not been able to put it down and been up till three in the morning. It's good. Unless you've got some talk the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so then we have these capabilities. And I put the role of a business analyst here. And these are roles, not people. By business analyst, I mean someone who can analyze that aspect of the business. And you can tell a capability because it's usually followed by a verb, the capability to record a photo, record a video, the capability to take a photo, the capability to make calls, receive calls, look up a number, book a copper trade, create this particular kind of report. Those are all capabilities. And you can get smaller scale capabilities that play into the larger ones. I'm not so worried about what scale it's done at as long as you recognize, have somebody who knows about that capability in the room, have the conversations with them. Um, to deliver those capabilities, we come up with a feature. And this is very software focused, but I'm gonna show you how this plays into lots of ideas. Um, so uh, it's a user interface component, something that can be used by a user, which enables capability. Okay, and we've got the designer who can design that user interface. We tell stories, little stories about why we want it. The thing that happened last year that, you know, we're trying to avoid again. 
Um, I've, I've worked with people who've had really negative press reports and the vision has been, we don't want that to happen anymore, you know. And that, that's been the real crux of it. So they tell stories about what's happened, what they would like to happen. Um, the stories often bring the developers, the people who are going to implement it in for the first time, and they listen to the stories. And then they have a better understanding of what it is they're trying to deliver. We might come up with examples while we're talking through the stories, examples of how somebody's going to use a system. And then we code, unless you're not actually working on a software project, in which case you end up with um, somebody who will implement, somebody who will turn it into reality. It's still a developer. They will develop the things, just not a software developer. So I have this lovely breakdown, vision, goal, capability, feature, story, scenario, code. Yay! It's that simple. No, it isn't. But it looks nice. Um, we know that breaking things down actually only works over here. It only works, and we keep trying to do it. Hands up if you're a non-agile project that breaks epics into stories and stories into tasks. I've been on those, yep. So it only works for predictable stuff. It doesn't work for stuff which is complex. If it worked, we would have this lovely fractal beauty and all of our projects would look like that. And we would go down the pub and say, wow, that project went really smoothly. That was amazing. On time, on budget, everything just worked. It's a little bit boring, in fact. Real projects don't look like that. Real projects look like this. Oh, we forgot a bit. Uh, we didn't know about that. And it turns out these guys are all connected together. And uh, we didn't need that bit. And we can't remember what that, oh, sugar. Um, <laughs> and it's full of what Dan North refers to as oh, crap moments, <laughs> right? These are discoveries. This is what our project is full of. This is what a real project looks like. It's entirely made up of these discoveries. So the Agile Manifesto says, we're discovering how to deliver software by doing it and helping others do it. We've been delivering software for decades before the Agile Manifesto was signed. We've been learning how to do it better. We've been helping others do it. This is not Agile's differentiator. It's definitely not Kanban's differentiator. We're discovering how to discover stuff by doing it and helping others do it. And one of the things I love most about this movement is that we are making this explicit. Dave, who's at the back of the room, has just been blogging a whole load of, of blogs around knowledge discovery. This is what we're doing differently. This is what happens in knowledge work. We are learning how to do this better and helping other people do it. The different levels of granularity are there so that you can see where, I'm going to borrow Dave's language, the activities, the knowledge discovery activities are, where the feedback loops are, where you actually make those, those discoveries. So for differentiating requirements, we want to try something out instead. We want to create an experiment. I'm just going to look at time. Here is something that I keep hearing in software projects, and it's been particularly prevalent with people who have picked up behavior-driven development, which is the art of talking through examples of how something might work, and they've jumped for the tools instead of the conversations. Very suspicious of this computer now, <coughs> haunted. Um, we can't accept this into our backlog without clear acceptance criteria. That's something I keep hearing. And all that does is it means that people go for the certain stuff. And they delay the uncertain stuff till later. On the assumption that, you know, it just requires a bit more analysis. We'll, we'll get there eventually. We'll understand it better. And when we understand it better, then we'll start working on it. And what this does is this. You have this apparent code of uncertainty, nicely reducing, <coughs> doing, you know, chonk, 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 here goes the work, flowing through the system. And then right at the end, then you get your real feedback loop when you actually release it, and then you make a load of discoveries and you realise that's not actually what your cone of uncertainty looked like. Because you left all those discoveries to the end. You had second order ignorance. You didn't know what you didn't know. 
here's what your cone of uncertainty actually looked like. <laughs> right? And one of the problems is that if you make these discoveries right at the end, frequently you find yourself in chaos and then your uncertainty will reduce very rapidly as your project folds. <laughs> or your company folds. <laughs> right? This is what happens when you make the discoveries close to the end. You've got, no, you've got no time to respond to it, you've got no options to respond to it. So I wanted to introduce you to the concept of deliberate discovery. This is something Dan North came up with, and I, it's looks easy and is really profound. The first rule is assume that you are ignorant about some stuff that you want to do. Assume second order ignorance. Assume that there is stuff in there that you do not know, you don't know. And optimize for discovery. Okay? I can tell you that if you've done it before, there will be far fewer discoveries than the stuff you've never done before. So you might not know what you don't know you don't know, but you know where it's going to be. It's going to be in the new stuff. So what I want to see is where's the new stakeholder who has the new goal that we've never met before? What's the capability we're going to deliver to that stakeholder that the business has never had? What can we do to try and deliver that capability? What experiments can we do? And if you've got a limited time frame, this is where things like set concurrent set-based engineering come in. Try lots of experiments at once. Tell the story that's never been told. What will happen when we actually release this? Can you imagine a user? Think of what the user might say. Think of the press reports you might get. Can you come up with a scenario in which this is a really positive idea? If you can't come up with a story and a scenario, it's not a good experiment. It doesn't mean that you'll have that story and scenario, but it means that you've checked to make sure it's at least realistic that it might work. And then you implement it, and then you get the feedback loop all the way up, and you show it to the flipping stakeholder who wants it, show it to the person who's actually the one who cares about that goal. For those of you who are agile and you think of user stories, I hate that term so much. A whole load of requirements are not actually about the users. As a user, I want to fill in a capture box because, no, wait, no. No, I don't. I'm sorry, I really don't. And while you're at it, can you take the ads off the site as well? Right? They're not for the benefit of the users. They're for other stakeholders who are not users, other people who have an interest in the project. So having de developed the capabilities, one of the things I've been getting people to do, and this was the first project I, I worked on with this, um, was a German energy trader. Every time I talked to them about the systems, they, they would just draw three boxes. Every single person would start talking about the system by drawing three boxes, and they were the three main big components. I said, okay, can you tell me what capabilities we have for each of these? Each of these systems, which capabilities do we have? And this thing, I didn't get to decide the MVP with them, so it was a chunky flipping project, year long. Um, tons of commoditized stuff, tons of really new stuff that had never been done before, tons of stakeholders who had never been made happy. I said, okay, write down the capabilities that each of the systems need to do. And don't worry if you miss some of the ones because sometimes we, we unconsciously, we're unconsciously competent. We forget things that we know how to do really well. I'm not worried about those because you know how to do it really well. Think about the new stuff. What are the new capabilities particularly? And then what do you need to backfill those? What else does it need to do? So we wrote those down. I said, okay, put a red dot on everything that you've never done before. And I had actually been asked to come in and teach Scrum. I was told this team was Scrum trained, so they'd been on their two-day course. I came in, they hadn't. So they didn't know what they were doing. I said, okay, but you guys, are, you don't know what you're doing, but you started work. Yeah. How did you do that? They said, well, we got the devs to talk to the, t to the main traders. I'm like, great, I don't want to touch this, right? <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll put the lightest Scrum framework around you I can to keep the PMR office off your back because that was what was really needed. 
Um, so I got them to estimate the capabilities. I said, which one's smallest? Call it 20, 20 story points. Which one's biggest? Call it 400. 20 times bigger, call it 400. Is there one in the middle that's about 200? Great, estimate the rest. I said, for every single red dot, double it unless you can tell me why not. It took one afternoon and those were our, our estimates and they never estimated in a sprint session again. What we did do was having delivered some of the smaller capabilities, we looked at how long it was taking and then we did our, um, our, our forecast based off of the probabilistic data and called it Scrum. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> um, so what happens is that as we pick off the risky capabilities first, the team take the capabilities, copy them to another board, and then start breaking them down with the riskiest features first. And they try and get a skeleton through these things. They try and get feedback on them, and they're not focusing on... Um, they're not focusing on actually break down everything and make sure we've got everything. They're focusing on how do we quickly get feedback? How do we make the discoveries as early as possible? And they have their meeting with their stakeholders every two weeks. And every two weeks, they have something to show the stakeholders with an expectation that they will make discoveries. This isn't a showcase where they go, you asked for this and we made this, aren't we good? This is a showcase where they are expecting to find things wrong especially this early and especially while they're busy creating these, these risky things. Um, we discovered very early on that there was a dependency with another team down the hallway. And they said, well, okay, we've got the APIs ready. How do we actually make discoveries now? I said, well, can you give them to this other team? They tried to do it and found they couldn't even set up a meeting with this other team. After a little investigation, it turned out there were eight other projects prioritised ahead of them they knew nothing about. That they realised was going to cause a delay of six months on this year-long project. They went to the board, they said, here's what we've discovered. And the board went, oh yeah, you're right. Well, we do care about those eight other projects more. They said, okay, as long as you're happy with this. That's what we're going to do. But they, they were able to start getting feedback throughout that year on the other stuff. And they gave themselves that option, a bit of extra time to respond to the discoveries they knew they would make when that dependency came on board. It's the first time they've ever actually seen a supposedly scrum process result in an extended deadline. So... Real options. I talked about how they gave them options for when they actually made the discoveries. Um, so Chris Matz and Olaf Marson came up with this, and they were thinking about financial options and how they play into real life. So they have three rules. They said you can't really price them. So if you ever read the Wikipedia page, you will realize this is very different to the real options on the Wikipedia page. They said options have value. Having choices is valuable. Options expire. Never commit early unless you know why. So I wanted to quickly tell, um, I'm actually starting to come short of time, so I'm just going to tell one story. And I, it's, it's a really great example of um, what I think of real options thinking. Um, so back in a couple of years back, three years back, there was Brickle Key Awards at the Lean Cam and North America conference. And the people who voted needed to vote on this short list of six and bring them down to two winners were people like David, people like... Um, John Reinertsen, Carl Scotland, so well-paid consultants, very busy, scatters all over the world. And they could not bring them together to be in the same room for the vote, and they needed to be in the same room. The only day they could reasonably get them together was on the Monday. The conference started Tuesday, the award ceremony was Thursday, and the lead time for getting the crystal trophies engraved was four weeks. So they got six trophies engraved. And then, in the voting, gradually eliminated the trophies and put them in the bin at a cost of $500, I think it was. Um, if you want to hear the other story at any point, you can do. Come and ask me and I'll tell it. Otherwise, it's also in this book. This is a graphic novel all about real options. I am a character in the graphic novel and I tell the story. It's a fake blog post that I haven't actually written, but it's in there. It's a real story. It really happened. So it's a great book. It's, it's meant to be two, three hours easy read. 
Um, I also wanted to talk about this company, just show you it's not just about software. Uh, this is Wikispeed. They are a car manufacturer. Um, they create modular vehicles, so you can swap the engine in and out, you can swap the steering in and out, you can swap the brake system in and out. Their car is road legal. It is the lightest, I believe, the lightest road legal car in the States right now, and it's 100 mile a gallon. American gallons, I believe they're slightly different to ours. But it's, it's an astonishing, astonishing feat. This is also a not-for-profit organization. So they're not making the cars for profit. I think they cost about 40K, $40,000. Um, but they're learning these techniques about how to do this in a really lean way. And what they do with the modular system is they buy themselves options. Um, there's an exercise, I'm not going to go into this uh, in too much detail, but it's an exercise I do. Get people to tell a story where they made a discovery, usually a problem that occurred. Find out what the moment of commitment was. Think about how you might address the ignorance and find the information before you make that commitment, or how you might create a safety net so that you have options if something goes wrong. What I usually find is that Acting to go and get the information up front works really, really well when it's something that ought to be predictable. And creating options works for a ton of other outcomes that might emerge. So as you move into the complex space, you're moving from, from creating something that addresses ignorance to creating something that provides you options. I've got five minutes left, so I want to talk really, really quickly about the role of diversity. Um, and creating experiments with diversity. So this is SenseMaker, this is Cognitive Edge's tool, and you can see what they've got here. This is a triad. Each of these dots is a story that they've tagged with, is it more to do with politics, circumstance, or process? And they get the respondents of these surveys to move a marker, and they can see where the clusters are happening, where the holes are that nobody's in that hole. They also have this thing called dyads, so sometimes they do it just with two points. And the idea of a dyad is that you have a complete absence of a thing at one end that's really, really bad, and too much of a thing at the other end that's really, really bad. So the example I used um, was, I love pair programming so much I want to do it on absolutely everything all the time, and I'm a complete introvert and I hate pair programming and I never, ever want to do it. You can put my side around, it doesn't matter. And the idea is that people will decide where on that line they want, and there's usually some golden mean in the middle. If you want an exercise to do, it turns out that you can get people to rank themselves across a room with these dyads, and it's a great way of seeing the diversity of opinion. You do not get it if you have one positive end and one negative end, because people will either go to one end or the other, they will polarise themselves. But if you have two negatives, they will spread themselves where they think they are. Whenever people get in the room together, though, they tend to form consensus. What I ask them to do is to pick where they're going to stand and then walk there, so they have at least some individuality. Um, I was in a, a training course where I, was, I asked people, you know, 60 seconds, come up with one way that people come to consensus and put it in the chat window. We were over WebEx, remote training. And the first person said voting, and the second person said polling, and the third person says, yeah, I'll go with voting too. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you see what just happened there, right? As soon as you get people together, they start collapsing into consensus. So if what you want is lots and lots of differentiation, we do what's called this shallow dive into chaos. So we, sometimes we, we have this innovation cycle, but we'll go down here briefly. And to do this, one of the things you want to do is keep people apart, not collaborate, because you get more diverse ideas, you get more diverse opinions that way. So I just want to really quickly talk about, and we're very nearly at the end, I wanted to talk about ritual descent. Uh, ritual descent, it's, it's very similar to Linda Rising's fly on the wall pattern. You explain your experiment, you sh explain why it's realistic, how you're going to amplify it if it goes well, how you're going to dampen it if it goes badly, you present it to another group, and then you turn your chair around or you put a mask on so they cannot engage with you emotionally at all. 
and they rip your experiment to shreds, and they are allowed to be brutal about it. So I did this with my training course. <laughs> um, I asked them to treat my training as if I was asking them to do an experiment with it and to tell me why that experiment was going to fail when they took my training back to their own place. This was on Thursday. We have one more morning of training left. I got the best feedback ever when I turned off my webcam and my mic and just sat there and listened to them ripping and just, it's going to fail for this reason, it's going to fail for this reason, we haven't thought about this, we haven't thought about this. I also had the option of that last morning to fill in all the gaps. So my formal training ended on the Thursday. The Friday was entirely filling in the gaps that came up from that experiment. And that was the best feedback I ever got. I love feedback. Please do give it to me. It keeps me going. Thank you. So we're just out of time. If you want to ask any questions and use up a bit of the break, I'm up for it. Um, but please come and find me. I'm, I'm here all day. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>